Friends, this morning we are finishing up our sermon series called Why. Uh, This sermon series is based on Adam Hamilton's book called Why, Making Sense of God's Will. And those of you who have been following along, today we're going to be uh, uh, looking at chapter 4 of Adam's book. During this sermon series, we have looked at those questions, those times when we ask the question, why, of God. Uh, Why do bad things happen to good people? Why does it seem like sometimes our prayers go unanswered? Why is it that we cannot see God's will for our lives? If you've missed any of the sermons in this series and you would like to catch up, there are two places where you can find them. You can either go to our website, the web address is there in your bulletin, uh, and there will be a link there to the sermons and you can view them on our YouTube channel. Or you can go to our Facebook page, and we record the sermons during the 11 o'clock service as well. And you can find it, uh, we do Facebook Live at that service, and so you can find the recordings there. And so you're welcome to to take a look at those um, if you wish. So today, in addition to the reading from Romans, thank you, Vondeline, for reading that for us, uh, I am reading from the uh, book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And these words occurred uh, right after Moses' death. After Moses, the Lord's servant died. The Lord spoke to Joshua, Nun's son. He had been Moses' helper. My servant Moses is dead. Now get ready to cross over the Jordan with this entire people to the land that I am going to give to the Israelites. I am giving you every place where you set foot, exactly as I promised Moses. Your territory will stretch from the desert and the Lebanon as far as the great Euphrates River, including all Hittite land up to the Mediterranean Sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you during their lifetime. I will be with you in the same way I was with Moses. I won't desert you or leave you. May God add wisdom to the reading, hearing, and understanding of these words. Friends, in this series, we have explored some of the questions that we ask of God, those why questions that gnaw at us. We've looked at why it seems like God allows us to suffer and why sometimes it seems like God ignores our prayers. We've also looked at why God's will for our lives seems so elusive. And in each case, we have come to realize that it is not God who is distant from us, but rather that sometimes bad things just happen. And often when it seems like God isn't speaking to us or isn't paying attention to us, that it's not God who is doing these things, rather it is us. We have pulled away from God. And so today as we finish up this series, I hope that we now realize that some of our old assumptions about how God works in the world just simply are not accurate. That because God's love always prevails, God works all things together for our good, for the good of those who love God according to God's purpose. In the fourth and final chapter of Adam Hamilton's book, he suggests three ways uh, in which God loves prevails, how God shows God's love for us, even in the face of suffering and tragedy. So let's take a look at these three things. The first is that God is always with us, even in the face of tragedy. We talked about this quite a bit during the first week of our series, When we receive a negative medical report or discover that our finances have taken a dive or when we're seriously uh, injured in a car accident, often we become fearful. We don't know what will happen in the near or distant future and that makes us scared. It's the fear of the unknown. 
And when those things happen, we often pray, asking God for a miracle, asking God to take our fears away. We ask God to heal us from this thing that has invaded our bodies. We ask God to somehow restore the funds in our bank accounts. We ask God to turn back the hands of time so that we can avoid that accident that we got into. We ask for a miracle. But as we've learned, that's not the way God works, is it? From a logical perspective, we know that God doesn't work that way, but we still ask, hoping that God will come through. But you know what? If we're paying attention, we know. We know that God has already come through because God has promised to always be with us, to never abandon us. God walks with us even in the face of hardship. We see those two sets of footprints in the sand in our mind's eye. But God also carries us through those dark times. This is what happens when we understand and come to trust that God is as near to us as the air we breathe. Adam Hamilton wrote those words. He goes on to say, It is not that God eliminates the frightening things in our lives, yet knowing God is with us gives us peace in the midst of the storms. We know all of these things because of what we read in Scripture, right? From the Old Testament stories of Noah and Abraham to the lives and ministries of Jesus and Paul in the New Testament, the entire biblical narrative is the story of the many ways, many ways that God has been present with God's people over time. We also heard about it this morning in the story of Joshua that I read just a few moments ago. This is one of those stories that speaks to God's presence in the lives of God's people. Now, we don't often hear about Joshua's role in, during the Exodus, most of the time because we're, our, fo- our energies are focused on Moses. But it was Joshua who made the final push into the Promised Land. It was Joshua who, by, who was named by God to succeed Moses as the leader of the nation of Israel. It was Joshua who led the people as they crossed over the Jordan River. It was Joshua who fought the battle at Jericho and made the walls come a-tumbling down. And it was Joshua who conquered the kingdom of Ai and defeated the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and more. And God was with him and his armies every step of the way into the promised land because God promised Joshua that God would be with him. And so Joshua placed his faith in God and he was not afraid. When we have faith in God, when we have faith that God will always be with us, then we too can push our fears aside. Faith is our response to fear. It is our complete and utter trust that God is working all things for our good. When we trust in God's presence, it gives us peace in the face of our suffering. Our faith in God's presence brings us comfort and strength. Hi, big guy. Go find dad. (laughs) The second way that we know God's love always prevails is in the way that God works through us to accomplish God's will and to share God's love. We talked about this during both the second and the third sermons in this series. God nudges us to go certain ways, to do certain things that will help God's people. God uses us to do God's will, even when we least expect it. 
I experienced this several years ago when I was serving a church over in West Phoenix. I had promised a church member that I would visit her in the hospital and I would bring communion to her. But when I woke up that morning, I realized I had no grape juice in my refrigerator. Well, I thought to myself, you know, I'm not that far from the church. I'll just run up there and, and grab some, some grape juice. I knew that we had some there. So as I got into my car, I started driving toward the church, and then a thought popped into my head. You know, the church is really in the opposite direction of where I'm supposed to go. I bet there's a convenience store where I could find some juice. I'll just head that direction. And so that's what I did. I headed in the direction of the hospital, looking for a convenience store. And sure enough, right there was a 7-Eleven. So I pulled into the driveway of the 7-Eleven, and there at the entrance I saw a woman. She was kind of standing off to the side. And she was leaning on a shopping cart, which obviously contained all of her worldly possessions. She was dirty and tired, and her face looked very thin. She also looked very, very sad. I smiled at her as I walked into the store, and as I searched for the grape juice, which, by the way, for future reference, 7-Eleven does not carry grape juice, <laughs> a thought occurred to me. Maybe God had sent me to have a conversation with this woman. So as I walked out of the store, empty-handed, I might add, I headed in her direction. I learned that her name was Pam, and she'd been living on the streets for about five months in the heat of the Phoenix summer. I asked when she had eaten last, and she said it had been a couple of days. So I gave her some money and suggested that she go and get something to eat. I also told her that I was a pastor and that I would like to pray with her, and she nodded as we stood there holding hands with one another, I felt her tears fall onto the back of my hands. I asked God to be with her and to help her through this difficult time in her life. And when I finished my prayer, we stood there for a moment. It was as if she did not want to let me go. We held hands for a little while then she smiled and thanked me. And then we said goodbye, and I never saw her again. But you know, as I drove away, it became more and more clear to me that God had sent me to that 7-Eleven, even though they didn't have what I needed. God used me to remind a woman named Pam, a homeless woman named Pam, about God's love for her. Running into Pam was not a coincidence. It was a God incidence. Because she needed to hear that God loved her. God sent me to Pam, and I didn't even know it until I got there. When I left the house that morning, I didn't know that I would be God's messenger. And you know, sometimes that's the way it works. Here's what Adam Hamilton says about that. We can't always see God's mysterious ways of working. We can't always see what God is up to. But I believe God is constantly working like this. The task for us is to make ourselves available to God each day and to pay attention. Pay attention. The third way that God reveals to us that God's love will always prevail is this. God forces evil and suffering to serve God's purpose. Or as Adam writes, God brings good from evil. God takes our sorrow, suffering, and sin and bends it, redeems it, and sanctifies us through it. Now, you might be thinking, how does God do that? How is it possible that God can take evil and suffering and transform them into something that is good? Well, consider the following. The assassination of, of Martin Luther King Jr. 
It added momentum to the civil rights movement in this country, which ultimately led to significant legislation that has protected many people in many different ways. The death of Hector Peterson, a young boy who was shot during the 1976 Soweto uprising in South Africa became the tipping point upon which the evil system of apartheid was abolished in that nation. And in the wake of the attacks on September 11th of 2001 in this country, we recognized the heightened secure, that the need for heightened security, and people were inspired to rush to the aid of the victims. Many folks rededicated their lives to serving God. Even some of the more recent natural disasters, like wildfires and hurricanes, tornadoes and flooding, through incidents like these and so many more, God has planted in the planted seeds in the hearts of God's people so that evil and suffering can be transformed into good. But my friends, the ultimate example of God's triumph over evil is through the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus was a shout from God that good would always triumph over evil. It was the ultimate sign that evil would never have the final word. When Jesus died on the cross that day, it looked like the forces of evil had triumphed over good. But God said no. God would not allow that to happen. And so on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead, demonstrating God's love for us. Through the resurrection, God declared in no uncertain terms that the worst thing would never be the last thing. That is the overwhelming message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Adam Hamilton says. The Bible proclaims hope in the face of the darkest of circumstances. It does not promise that we won't go through difficulties or that we won't experience pain. But these will not be the final word. My friends, every Easter we celebrate this message of hope. We do that by singing hymns and songs like the one that we are going to sing at the end of this worship service this morning, and by retelling the story of Jesus' triumph over death, by calling to mind that as the Apostle Paul once wrote to his churches, that nothing can separate us from the love of God, neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor present things or future things, not power, nor height, nor depth. But you know, even as we celebrate this miraculous and hope-filled event, sometimes when we are faced with suffering and disaster, our faith in God's love will wane. And we might even ask ourselves, do you really believe this stuff? Do you really believe that good triumphs over evil and that the worst thing is never the last thing? Well, friends, I hope that when that happens, that you will remember what Pastor Adam shares with his congregation every Easter Sunday. Here is what he says. Every year, people ask me, do you really believe in the resurrection? Do you really believe that Easter means the worst thing is never the last thing? Do you really believe that ultimately good will triumph over evil and God's love will ultimately prevail? And my answer, Adam says, is always the same. I not only believe it, I am counting on it. My friends, I hope that you are counting on it too. Amen.